um, after class. It's going to happen with parents at home when you ask your kids, what'd you learn about in confirmation class today? And it's going to happen with mentors. Um, our hope is that mentors will be meeting um, with their mentees no fewer than five times uh, during this process. And mentors, you are going to receive um, a little bit more guidance um, in written form, um, but that will come with, uh, with our new uh, youth director who's going to be starting on January 4. We haven't had an official announcement about that yet, uh, but it is coming and we're very excited um, that she's going to be starting with us. So that'll be a chance for her to um, to uh, to meet y'all uh, is by offering some of that guidance. So just hold tight uh, for now. That is coming. Um, but in the meantime, um, we're glad that y'all are, are part of this class. This is really... Um, it is a chance for, um, for y'all to stay kind of a step or two <laughs> ahead of uh, what the kids are learning. Um, in this class, we are not going to cover every single little thing that they're going to be covering. Obviously, we don't have the time to do that. This is meeting uh, once a month, whereas the kids are going to be meeting once a week. Um, I promised that I'd come back to why we're meeting at seven o'clock on Sunday evening. We're meeting at seven o'clock on Sunday evening because uh, our hope is that most of the confirmation class will be in person on Sunday mornings. Uh, and this will obviously continue to meet over Zoom because there are there are too many of you to meet to meet safely anywhere sort of in the near future. So um, when you are bringing, and this, this is obviously most uh, relevant to parents, but when you are bringing your kids uh, to class on Sunday morning, um, you know, I was kind of imagining you tuning in for this Zoom uh, meeting, like on your phones and your cars in the parking lot. <laughs> and that didn't sound very conducive to learning either. So that is why we were, we are doing it, uh, in the evening, um, and just once a month. So we're going to try to cover as much as we can, uh, in this once a month evening, um, class. Okay. Again, it's not going to be everything your kids are talking about. Um, my goal here is to kind of whittle down all of the stuff they're talking about into like one or two theological nuggets um, that are really important. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about in these classes so that you all feel um, hopefully just more equipped um, to meet what I'm sure will be really good, deep questions from your kids since that's what we're going to be encouraging them to do. So um, my hope is that um, when they bring those really good, uh, thought-provoking, tough questions home, um, we all know that, of course, it's fine to say, you know what, I don't know. <laughs> um, that's a really good question. Why don't, let's hang on to that and, and, um, and, you know, maybe follow up with the pastor or the teacher or somebody um, and, and find an answer. Um, that is always, always, always um, a fine answer. Um, and I want you to feel more equipped to, um, to also dig in a little bit so that maybe um, that's the answer half the time. <laughs> and the other half of the time you can say, oh, we, you know, we talked about this uh, in that Parents and Mentors of Compromise class. So, um, and this is what we talked about, you know, there. So, um, so that's my hope um, for you all. Um, I am going to go ahead and try to share my screen here. Okay. All right, can you all see that? Give me a nod of the head. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So, um, confirmation. What is it all about? Uh, two key words. It's a process, obviously. We're starting, they start on January 11, and then they will be confirmed if they so choose on May 16th. So it's a process. It's not an overnight thing. Um, and it's also a proclamation. So on confirmation Sunday, um, the confirmands will stand up and they will 
affirm these uh, questions in front of the whole church. Who knows what that will look like <laughs> uh, this year? It looked a little bit different last year. So we'll just have to see uh, what it looks like when we get to that point. But in some way in front of the whole church, they will affirm uh, these things. Um, these are very similar to the questions that uh, parents answered uh, on behalf of these confirmands, most of them, not all of them, but most of them um, when they were babies. So uh, confirmation is really a process that takes place in churches that have a tradition of baptizing babies. Obviously, babies can't answer these questions for themselves. So when we sprinkle uh, that water on their heads, it's the parents that are making these promises for them. Um, and confirmation is when, um, is when those now mostly grown babies, growing babies, right, uh, make those uh, promises for themselves, right? So um, the questions, y'all can follow along as I, um, just so we're clear where we're going. You can, you can read along while I'm reading them. Uh, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Who is your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? Will you? And will you devote yourself to the church's teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of the bread and the prayers? So um, this, this is not a set of questions that <laughs> we intend to be answered kind of willy-nilly. Um, the kids are going to be using this curriculum called Theo Academy. We chose it because it has a big video component. So we thought if we're on Zoom, especially, uh, sometimes that would be helpful. Also helpful for our teachers who, because we have this class broken into three, uh, typically our teachers are used to teaching maybe one or two classes per month, but this year's teachers are gonna be teaching class every single week because they each have their own cohort. So having this video uh, curriculum, it won't all be on video, but a good chunk of it is, um, is also just helpful for our teachers who have signed up for kind of a big, uh, uh, big task this time around. Um, in any case, in this curriculum that's called Theo Academy, um, there's this uh, component in each uh, episode called Ask the Pastor, and it's an unscripted um, exchange between a confirmand and their pastor um, in their respective uh, sanctuaries. And in the first, the very first episode, I believe that the kids are going to be watching, there's this exchange between um, one of the confirmands and her pastor. And she asks him, so are we just like standing up there and like saying a bunch of words? <laughs> he kind of takes a beat and, and goes, gosh, no, <laughs> please. Um, we don't need, um, we don't need more of that. Um, we need you to be able to say these things with, um, with integrity, right? Um, these are not questions that we're just answering willy nilly. So these questions, even though the curriculum is not based exactly around them, um, they, uh, they are stated at the beginning, the kids know that this is where they, they're gonna end and they weave their way in and out of, um, of this curriculum and of this months long um, process. So the hope is that by the time they are standing up uh, and answering these questions, um, in the affirmative that they're they're doing so um, with a great sense of, of of integrity they know what they're saying right um so you know they're going to be looking at um at these questions and kind of picking them apart so what do we mean when we talk about sin um why are we going to talk about grace before we talk about sin you know if you look at this the set of questions, the very first question is about sin. It makes you think it's kind of important, right? But in this curriculum, we actually talk about grace before we ever get um, to sin. And there's a reason for that. So they're going to dig into that. Um, evil, renouncing evil. What the heck? 
um, it's a term that sounds kind of archaic and our kids are smart and they know that, you know, we've used this term to paint whole groups of people um, a certain way. We've said whole groups of people are evil. Um, it's kind of a scary word. So what do we mean when we say evil? Surely that's not what we mean. So what do, um, what do we mean? Um, what kind of power does it really have um, in the world? Um, who is your Lord and Savior? Even that question, right? It seems like the most simple <laughs> question. It's sort of the crux of, of who we are. Um, but even this language is loaded, right? We Lord was a, a title that was common around Jesus's time, but we don't we don't walk around calling. Um, people Lord <laughs> uh, these days. So what does it mean to say that Jesus uh, is Lord, you know, in our lives and that nothing else or no one else is? Uh, and what do we mean when we say that Jesus is Savior? What is Jesus saving us from, right? Um, will you devote yourself to the church's teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread uh, and the prayers? What does the Christian life look like within the context um, of community, right? Why is it that we even do this in community? Why isn't it something that we can just do kind of on our own? Right? So they're gonna, they are gonna be getting into the meat <laughs> um, of all of this, okay? Um, a question before we go on that I want y'all to, um, to answer for me, and we'll do this via the chat I'm gonna to try to find. Well, I'll ask you all the question while I try to find my chat. <laughs> all right. Um, why do you want your child or your mentee to be confirmed? Not a trick question rather simple one, but I think an important one. Why, why are we here? Why are they about to begin this process? Why do you want your child or your mentee to be confirmed? to affirm it as his decision to be an active part of Adawild and her ministry. To feel the connection to a church family who loves and supports all people and asks good questions and support a faith journey to feel a safe belonging. To understand the church's teaching and choose for himself who is his savior. So she can be God's hands and feet here in Memphis. We want Kate to begin to make her own wise decisions. We trust IPC to guide her to be part of a church she loves. Give y'all just one more minute. Build stronger faith and guidance in his life. I want her to know what it means to be a member of the church, the nuts and bolts of it, and to really think about if this is where she wants to be. So that Eliza has the foundation upon which she can begin to forge her own faith path, to feel her place in this community. to discern her own faith and learn more about her individual connection with God.
we would like for Jane Elaine to have a stronger understanding of and connection to the community of faith that Wild has provided. When we had that lag time, I was about to um, take the opportunity to tell you all that I'm really okay with silence and I think it can be informative, <laughs> but I don't think I actually need to do that. Thank you. To feel part of worship, of a worship community that loves her apart from her family. Thank you all. Um, you can keep that coming if you'd like. Um, oh, let me read one more. In my numerous interactions with Noah, he exudes goodness and love, which are the essential elements of being good disciples of Christ. I would love to hear in his own words what exactly being a follower of Christ means to him. Um, Laura, thank you for that. Um, as someone else that knows um, Noah, I would have to <laughs> agree with everything that you said. Um, and you remind us that, you know, this is a two-way um, street. Y'all are going to learn just as much from your kids and uh, your mentees as they're going to learn. Um, from you in this process. So uh, to be part of a loving church who will be a support to her always. Yeah. Thanks y'all. Um, so <laughs> this slide confirmation, are we brainwashing them? Kind of a strong word. Um, you know, sometimes we talk about baptism as being God's yes to us um, and confirmation being our yes back to God. Um, because we baptize so many babies, obviously, um, you know, baptism <laughs> uh, can't be about um, the person who is being baptized uh, kind of saying yes to God first. So in that sacrament, um, when we baptize uh, babies rather than adults, and we do baptize adults as well. Um, that is what we're saying, uh, among other things, is that God says yes to us before we can ever uh, even name God or uh, claim God as our God. But then in confirmation, we are saying, um, we're saying yes back to God. Um, this probably won't come as a great shock to y'all, but our kids, this is a generation that has been um, advertised to um, since before they were out of the womb. Um, and because of that, they have really good, uh, really, really attuned meters for when um, somebody is advertising something to them. So <laughs> we can say, no, that's not what we're doing. We're not trying to sell you something. Um, but they, they're, they're very attuned to that in a way that, um, um, that we're, we are perhaps not as attuned to. Um, so this, this curriculum that they're using, it starts right there because it kind of assumes that that's what at least a number of them are kind of bringing in uh, the question that they're kind of bringing into this process. Are you just going to brainwash me? That's the word um, that they use. And in response to that question, they say, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of are. Um, they start just by owning it. Um, and they say, you know, we think that both being a Christian and being uh, a Presbyterian flavor of Christian is just a really good kind of solid way <laughs> of being um, in the world. Um, so so a lot of what we are doing kind of in this process is um, trying to convince you, you know, that that's a way, that's a good way, um, uh, you know, to be. Um, that being said, it is a genuine choice. I saw in, in, the, in the, the responses that y'all gave to why do I want my, my kid or my mentee uh, to be confirmed, I saw, uh, I saw that reflected in a lot of your responses. You want to make sure that it's a genuine 
um, decision that they're making at the end. Um, and that is, um, that's, that is on point. That is our hope um, as well. Um, Presbyterians believe that discipleship is serious. Um, it's challenging. Um, but it's also something that we enter into with a sense of, of joy. It's not something that is, um, that is coerced, right? It's not something that's been forced. Um, so if your child or your mentee uh, comes to the end of this process in May, if they come to that retreat when they're writing those faith statements and they decide that they are not ready to be confirmed that it's not something that feels right that is totally fine um you know eighth grade 13 years old 14 years old um those are really those are arbitrary numbers and the holy spirit is not uh is not confined to them um we had a couple of kids last year that decided not to get confirmed at the end of the process and that was the right choice um, for them. So that can be, uh, a f that can reflect faithful discernment, um, either way. Okay. Um, <laughs> speaking of choice though, this is where we're going to get kind of into the, uh, the sort of theological meat, uh, of tonight. Um, choice, uh, is usually the word that we kind of attach to confirmation, right? Where these kids are choosing, they're gonna choose at the end uh, to be confirmed, to answer those questions that we uh, looked at at the beginning um, in the affirmative, right? They're gonna choose whether or not they do that. Um, there are some traditions, I think you all know, that put a lot of importance on uh, confirmation. It's actually the traditions that put probably the most emphasis on it are the ones where baptism is is tied uh, to confirmation. I had a, a friend um, in adolescence and in high school um, who came from a very, uh, very conservative, very evangelical uh, family, and um, she was getting she got engaged when she was 18. Um, and I remember uh, sitting across from her at a coffee shop and saying, wow, like marriage, that's, that's, that's a huge <laughs> decision. This was something that I could barely even, uh, you know, wrap my, my head around at that time. And here she was going and getting married. Um, and she said, yeah, it is a really, uh, it's a really big decision. It's the second most important decision that you'll make in your entire life. And uh, incredulous. I said, well, what is the most important decision? And she looked at me very earnestly and said, Sarah, the most important decision is whether or not you accept Jesus Christ as your, um, as your Lord and Savior. So indeed, <laughs> indeed, we're in, we are in agreement. Uh, we are in agreement there. And we also know that the tradition that she um, that she was speaking out of um, puts an emphasis there kind of based on a different motivation than what Presbyterians um, base it on, right? Um, it doesn't mean it's not important. It just means that the motive um, is different, right? So when we're talking about confirmation, we are talking about choice, sort of, <laughs> um, because in scripture, choice is actually kind of a, um, a complicated thing. So you may have heard uh, about this as a debate within the Christian family between predestination and free will which all kind of boils down to the question, can you really choose? How free are we really um, to choose God and to choose God's way in the world, to choose salvation? Um, we're not gonna take as much time with this as we did 
with the first um, feedback. But if y'all will take just a second, if something comes to you immediately, um, and I just want you to put in the chat, it comes to predestination, to that word, um, to that idea. Uh, what do you know about it? And what do you like about it? If you don't like anything about it, you can also say that. That's fair too. Predestination. There is comfort in knowing God knew me before I knew God. God's gift, just accept it. The assurance that we have God's love no matter what. All right. Oh, y'all are good. We are children of God from the beginning. I have thought of it that I am predestined to be in relationship with God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit in some way, and it is bigger than I know. But I have freedom of choice knowing God will love me even if she must cry over my choices sometimes. Elizabeth, I think you have shifted us so uh, free will, what do we know and like about free will? This is predestination. God is driving the bus and I am not in charge. What about free will? What do we know and like about it? Love and support and the ability to make your own choices and live through the consequences and still have God's love surrounding you. The route is not set in stone. God is driving the bus and I'm not in charge and I'm not God's puppet. I have freedom to make choices, good and bad. Free will gives me the power to make my own choices. However, I believe that the Holy Spirit leads me to those decisions. Y'all are giving some really good uh, answers. You're making me think we're doing something right in Christian formation. <laughs> These are solidly reformed answers. All right, y'all. Um, so um, y'all named really the good news <laughs> that's found on both sides of this debate, right, between predestination uh, and free will. So um, 
predestination, and <laughs> it's probably John Calvin, who is one of our, you know, our kind of reformed fathers um, that made this uh, doctrine really famous. Um, uh, and he called it double predestination, right? We've got some, some people that are uh, preordained to uh, eternal glory and others that are preordained to eternal punishment. And we have absolutely nothing, um, nothing to say um, about the matter. So, um, and then there's another uh, kind of lesser, um, uh, maybe lesser known uh, or lesser, uh, certainly not something that John Calvin said, but it's called uh, universalism. And that's, um, that's, that is predestination in a way too, that says that, um, you know, God really preordains uh, all, uh, all to salvation, all uh, to glory. And there's not a lot that we can say or do uh, about that either. So, um, so predestination, whether we're talking about that double predestination of Calvin or universalism is good news because it emphasizes God's sovereign power, right? Um, we, we generally like to think that the, uh, that the future of our world is ultimately in uh, God's hands. So sort of from a cosmic standpoint, there's comfort in knowing, right, that, um, that we're not saving this world, that, um, that God is doing it. Um, and predestination, uh, with that understanding, um, you know, we're affirming that it's not just the world, but everyone in it, um, everyone's fate um, is ultimately in God's hands and, um, and not in ours. Right? Um, and we have scripture, um, you know, that, uh, that backs this up. That is the reason that, uh, right, that, that Augustine, Calvin and others um, kind of came up with this, um, this theology, right? In Matthew, it says, many are called, but few are chosen. That sounds kind of double predestiny. Uh, God has mercy on whomever he chooses and hardens the heart of whomever he chooses. That's what Paul says in the letter to the Romans. Um, and then in Ephesians, in the fullness of time, all things will be gathered up um, in Christ. So also predestination, but from more of a universalist kind of standpoint. Um, free will, and this is really, um, when we talk about free will, um, and kind of the, and the, the, the theology of it, at least at the beginning, um, we're talking about a guy named Pelagius. Um, so it kind of in, in, uh, in theological school, they will refer to this instead of talking about free will, it's Pelagianism named for Pelagius. Um, it's the big word that we use for the free will kind of side of the argument. Um, that's obviously good news because especially in response to that kind of scary double predestination thing, um, we do have a choice. So uh, we obviously can't choose to merit our way to salvation through good deeds or through um, following the law to a T, but we can choose faith, right? We can choose um, to turn to God um, and to ask God um, to come in. So it gives us some agency. Um, Y'all named all of this. Um, that free will um, part that I just described and that you all really just described um, probably sounds really familiar um, because it is it is sort of the um, the predominant kind of way uh, that pro that both Protestantism and Catholicism have kind of veered in um, kind of in the modern era. Um, it probably sounds to us like it's a little bit closer to what our official position is uh, rather than predestination. But uh, Martin Luther and John Calvin actually uh, rejected it. If, 
if anything, uh, you know, they really did veer more <laughs> on the side of uh, predestination. So that is the tradition um, that we uh, that we sit in, and they they rejected that that kind of free will argument, um, mainly because they said it overestimates our freedom to turn to God, that we are not nearly as free um, as we think we are. Um, to get this out of kind of heady land, you know, this is, <laughs> this is actually a really great place to kind of enter into conversation with, um, with your kids. Um, because as adolescents, they're really in a pretty raw place. Um, and it's probably easier for them in a way to kind of tap into that reality that they're not nearly as free <laughs> as they think or as they would like to be. Um, they know how hard it is to really, really, really choose for themselves how to dress, how to speak, what to eat, uh, what to prioritize, what to, um, what to care about, right? So, you know, that was kind of the emphasis of the reformers that the, the free will kind of argument just overestimates our freedom. Um, and it ultimately makes the whole thing more about faith than about grace, because everything ultimately depends on our turning to God, um, which is ultimately um, self-salvation, right? It makes God's love um, kind of conditional. So that was their, that was their argument. Um, as with, as with most things, um, I think the answer, in as much as we uh, can find one when we're talking uh, about anything to have to do with God, um, the answer is found somewhere, um, somewhere in between those two things, right? They don't have to be pit against each other. So a way of thinking about this is instead of choosing between predestination or free will, um, we can say predestination, therefore free will. Or another way of saying this, grace, therefore choice. Um, that's what happens when we put them together. So we start um, with the truth that we are not actually free. Um, we're enslaved to all sorts of things. We're enslaved to greed and to lust and to addiction and to comfort and to our own philosophies and ideologies. Um, we're kind of a hot mess. And that is where God's grace meets us. That's where God meets us with grace, right where we are. And it is what makes us free, or at least freer and able to choose um, as best we can every hour, every day, every week, every month, right? Every year, um, which way we're going to go. Um, you know, I shared all of that stuff about predestination, um, not only because it is in our tradition, uh, and it's a part of our tradition that we don't talk about <laughs> a lot. We don't usually say that word. Um, but, but I also share it because I do think it is a helpful um, corrective, a, a, a gentle corrective. Um, to the ideas that we sometimes have around confirmation. Um, it is not all about the choice that our confirmands make at the end. It is about that, but it is just as much about discovering the God who chooses us. It's just as much about God's choice as it is about 
our choice, right? It's about discovering the God um, who is gracious, um, who is so gracious that it enables our confirmands to even consider a lifetime of, um, of discipleship, right? So the kids are gonna spend a lot of time talking about um, grace in these first few weeks before they even get to sin and all the other stuff. Um, because for us, that's, um, that's where it all begins. That's what grounds um, this whole thing. It's where we begin and it's where um, we end. So it is about their choice in the end, but it's just as much about celebrating um, God's choice, the fact that God has chosen us. Um, and we certainly have a hope, right, about their choice in the end. But first and foremost, uh, as Presbyterians, what we are celebrating is that God has chosen, um, God has chosen us. Um, we have a few minutes left and I've done a whole lot of talking. So I'm actually, I'm going to stop sharing here for a minute. Actually, hang on. I'm going to give you one more slide. I'm going to put you all in breakout rooms um, just for 10 minutes or so. When we come back, um, we're going to pray over our kids. Um, and that's how we'll end our time together. But I am going to put you all in breakout rooms just for a few minutes. So you can talk to each other. Um, you're going to learn just as much from each other. And the more you practice talking about these things with each other, the more equipped you'll be to talk to your kids about these things. Um, so go ahead, if you can, and take a screenshot of this because you're probably going to lose it in a minute. Um, but these are the three questions I want you to consider in those breakout rooms. Um, first, again, that question that we answered in the chat, why do you want your child or your mentee to be confirmed? Um, and then consider that statement that we spent some time around tonight. We're not as free as we think. In what ways has that been true in your own life? And in what ways can you see it in the life of our children? And finally, what does the word grace evoke for you? So hold on to that for a minute. Jot it down or take a screenshot. I'm going to stop sharing. <clears throat> All right, y'all, and I think you're about to get an invitation to go into a breakout room, so please take it. There we go.
That was quick. Were you also are you surprised to be back in here or did the warning work? Okay. <laughs> All right, y'all. I hope that, that was helpful. Um, you know, we have to be so intentional about creating community these days. So I do hope if you were in the middle of a conversation that you wanted to continue with somebody, just give them a call. You can find all your numbers uh, in Realm. Um, just make sure to keep those conversations going. Okay. They're important. Um, you know, if this was a year like, uh, like other years, we would be kicking off this progress or this process with a big bang uh next sunday with a confirmation breakfast and at the end of that breakfast we would be taking everybody into the sanctuary uh, parents mentors confirmands and we'd be gathering around the font and um and we would be beginning the process there and praying over um the kids and obviously that is not something that we can do um that we can do this year. Uh, when the kids do begin, and they will be on Zoom uh, for those first couple classes, but when they begin on the 11th, I will be hopping into each of those Zoom rooms to do some sort of a ritual, um, kind of beginning with them so they can mark the beginning of this process. Um, and today, or tonight, um, I am gonna close us all um, with prayer and my hope, um, besides continuing to come to this once a month class, um, I hope that y'all will continue to pray, not just for uh, your particular kid, but for this whole class as they, um, as they go through this process, okay? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and pray, beginning with uh, the psalmist's words, okay? Let us pray. O oh Lord, you have searched us and known us. You know when Anna sits down and when she rises up. You discern Claire's thoughts from far away. You search out Michael's path and his lying down and are acquainted with all Jane Elaine's ways. Even before a word is on John's tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. You hem Evan in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon him. Such knowledge is too wonderful for Noah. It is so high that he cannot attain it. Where can Ellen go from your spirit? Or where can Mary Porter flee from your presence? If Eliza ascends to heaven, you are there. If she makes her bed in shale, you are there. If she takes the wings of the morning and settles at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead her and your right hand shall hold her fast. If Isabella says, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day for darkness is as light to you. For it was you who formed Lydia's inward parts. You knit her together in her mother's womb. Georgia praises you, for she is fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works that Kate knows very well. Maggie's frame was not hidden from you when she was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld all of their unformed substances. In your book were written all the days that were formed for them, when none of them as yet existed. How weighty to us are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. We try to count them. They are more than the sand. We come to the end and we are still with you. Oh God, we are still with you. And so are these children that you have entrusted to our care from the time they were infants. They have come to the beginning of this confirmation process 
a place that we promised to bring them when we sprinkled the water over their heads and made those promises on behalf of them. And so I pray that you would pour out your spirit, grant them openness, curiosity, a sense of mystery and awe before it all. Grant them courage to ask all of the hard questions, compassion as they come alongside their peers. And most of all, I pray that you would touch them with your grace and that it would invoke in them hearts of gratitude. We go into this trusting that you are our God yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and that you indeed are holding all of us in the palm of your hand. In Christ's name we trust and pray. Amen. All right, y'all. Thank you for being here. I will see you in a month and you'll get lots of information between now and then, I promise. <laughs> Have a good night. I'll see you later. Thanks, Sarah. My pleasure. Thank you.